Good morning, everybody. We're live from the bird house. It is June 21st and today we're talking about how you can squirrel proof your bird feeders. It is possible. Um, it can take some maneuvering and some trying some different things, but it is possible. So we'll talk about that today. As always, if you're on, you can say hi in the comments or let us know what kind of things that you are seeing in your backyard, whether it be um, birds or bugs or bees, butterflies, all that good stuff. So let's let us know. We love to know what kind of things you are seeing. And of course, if you have something that you use in your yard that is great to, to help keep squirrels out, we'd love to know what that is as well. So let's get started. I thought first we talk about the different types of squirrels that we do have around um, here in the upstate New York area. And this is true of most of the East Coast. Um, so squirrels in general, the whole family of squirrels are distinguished from other rodents by their bushy tail. They have chisel-like teeth, which continuously grow, so that's why they're constantly chewing. They have strong legs, they have sharp claws, which make it uh, great for them to climb easily. Many have sensitive whiskers on their face and front legs to help them navigate as well. So if you've ever wondered how they can maneuver so well, they have lots of whiskers, not only on their face, but on their body as well. So squirrels are very territorial. They average to be three to five years or so in the wild, but they've been known to live as long as eight or 10 years and color variations are very common. Um, squirrels can find, a, uh, can find food buried beneath a foot of snow, which is pretty incredible. A squirrel's front teeth never stop growing. A newborn squirrel is about an inch long, so they're very, very small at birth. Um, they do get bulky to stay warm during the winter, and squirrels don't bury, don't dig up everything that they've buried. So this results in more trees, and you might find, you know, little sunflower plants popping up in your backyard. You can probably thank a squirrel for that kind of thing. So the squirrels do bury lots of things. They cache them to find them later, but they don't necessarily recover all of those. The gray squirrel, that is our most common squirrel, and that's going to be the one that we most commonly find in the backyards and we're most commonly trying to um, squirrel proof things from, they have very different color combinations that can be pretty common. So the typical color combination we see of the gray squirrel is in the top left here, very gray. They've got a white belly. They've got little kind of brownish patches on their face and on the side of their body. There are melanistic variations that we can find locally, which that means those are those black squirrels. So when you do see black squirrels, they're actually gray squirrels. They are a color combination uh, or they're a color morph of the gray squirrel. So black squirrels and are the same species. You can sometimes find albino squirrels and that's in this bottom left. What makes a true a, a squirrel or any animal truly albino is going to be total lack of any kind of color pigment and then the um, bright red eyes. So truly albino animals aren't super common in the wild because they're really sensitive to light um, and they're because they're so bright white they can be picked off by predators quite often but what you might find is what's in this top right corner here is a squirrel or another animal that's leucistic meaning it's lacking some color pigments so that's like this gray squirrel here in the top right is a leucistic squirrel. It's missing some pigments, so it looks quite white, but it does still have that dark colored eye. So there's different types of color combinations. And this is true not only with squirrels or gray squirrels, but other animals as well. Like if you ever see a bird that has a white patch on its wing, it's missing some pigment there. That's a, that's a bird that is leucistic or leucistic. Um, the gray squirrel is nature's regenerator of forests. They hoard food in numerous small caches for later recovery. Some caches are recovered after only hours or days, but some not until months later. So one squirrel alone can make several thousand caches per season. So that is a lot of seed that they might be taking from your feeders and putting it all around different places. Uh, squirrels have an, uh, a, a spatial memory that's very acute, so they can remember where they've buried things based on distant and nearby landmarks. Uh, 
They also use their sense of smell to uncover caches. And gray squirrels are considered crepuscular, meaning they're more active during dawn and dusk. So they kind of hunker down during the day and during the night, but you'll find them most active in the early daytime hours and then in the evening hours. And they don't hibernate, so they are around all year long, as you probably know. You might find right now gray squirrel nests in trees. That's this in the top left here. In the winter, they'll roost in hollow cavities or screech owl houses. So here's a little picture here of a squirrel poking its head out of a hollow cavity. So they tend to use those only during the winter months. And then in the spring and in the summer when they are having their babies, they will make a leaf nest, which is called a dray in trees. So those are really commonly found right now. You can find those. If you see a big bushy um, pile of leaves basically in a tree, that is a squirrel nest. They may breed twice a year and the first litters are born pretty early. So they're born in February and in March. And then the second litter is born in June or July. So we might start to see that second litter. Um, I know I had some young squirrels running around the backyard last week. So that's probably from a second litter. And each litter is anywhere <clears throat> from one to four young. So um, they can have quite a few babies each year. Now we also have red squirrels and red squirrels are smaller than the gray squirrel. They are very territorial. If you've ever had one <clears throat> in your yard or by your feeders, you might find that they are, are very territorial. They make a lot of sound to scare off um, other squirrels from, from being in their territory. They prefer to be around conifer trees. So if you do have pine trees, that's what they really do prefer. And they're most active during the day. So they're active during the daytime hours and they don't hibernate either. So they are around again all year round. They feed primarily on seeds from conifers and they will cache them as well, just like the gray squirrel will. They may have one to seven caches, so they'll have put them in different spots. And most red squirrels only have one litter a year of three to four young. And they're very, very vocal. You know, we've got some behind the store. We've got some trees. We're on a little trail. And um, the red squirrels all day, you can hear them with their chattering. Um, so they are very, very, very vocal. So this is our red squirrels, much smaller than the gray squirrel, that reddish colored fur and that red tail and that white around their eye. So that is your red squirrel. And then we also have the chipmunk. The chipmunk is in the squirrel family. If you're on the West Coast, you've guys got lots of different species of chipmunk. Here we've got the Eastern chipmunk. And they are a small squirrel with their distinctive stripes down their back. They live in wooded areas and parks and backyards. They prefer habitat with brush piles, logs, or rocky surfaces, somewhere there where they can easily hide. And they'll have one to two litters a year also of anywhere between three to five young. And they'll undergo long periods of rest or torpor in the winter where they really slow down. You're not going to see them really underneath your feeders during the winter time because they are at rest. And they can climb trees are often seen running around on the ground. They construct these elaborate tunnel systems um, where they have different rooms and different chambers for different things. So they've got places where they stash their food. They have places where they raise their young. So they make these really elaborate underground tunnel systems. They're mainly active during the day and they'll transport food as you've probably seen before in their cheek pouches. So they'll stuff their cheeks really full and that's how they transport their food. Now we also do have flying squirrels. Um, they don't truly fly like a bat will, but they glide from tree to tree. So they have what's called a patagium. It's a furry, almost like a parachute. So when they stretch out their arms and legs, it creates this parachute that allows them to sail from tree to tree. So they can do some really good gliding and their tail will provide stability. So they can almost angle where they're going with their tail. So we do also have flying squirrels. So if you're noticing that overnight, you're getting feeders that are drained, um, it could always be a raccoon, but it could very well be also a flying squirrel. So keep that in mind too. Um, flying squirrels are nocturnal. They'll spend the winter in tree cavities and they make a nest in the trees in the spring and summer. So similar to a gray squirrel and they are fairly common. So um, it would not be uncommon for you to have one in your backyard. You just may have never seen it before because of the, the time of the day that they're active is when we are not. 
in general. So this is our northern flying squirrel is what we have. Um, and then there's also a southern flying squirrel. So we, there are two different species of flying squirrels in our area. And then last but not least, there is another type of squirrel, the groundhog or the woodchuck. They are in the squirrel family and they belong to a, large, a family of large ground squirrels called marmots. And they have teeth, their incisor teeth also keep growing and growing, and they can grow up to a, a 1 16th of an inch each week. So this is why these squirrels are constantly chewing and chewing because their teeth keep growing. As you know, if you've ever had one in your yard, woodchucks are very well adapted for digging and they'll dig tunnel systems as well. Um, but they're not going to be so much a nuisance at your bird feeders because they're mostly herbivorous. So they're eating lots of grasses, they're eating flowers. So you really don't have to worry about them so much under your bird feeders. They will retreat to their burrow when threatened and they use their burrows to sleep to raise their young and to hibernate. So these undergo, undergo true hibernation, meaning they will, their body totally slows down for the winter. They don't stir or anything like that in the winter. They will go to sleep and then they wake up in the spring. And uh, one study, I thought this was fun. One study found that an average woodchuck burrow has had 384 four pounds of dirt excavated to make it. So these woodchucks are making some pretty big holes and they are very, very good diggers. But as far as squirrels go, if you've ever put out a bird feeder, you've probably found that not only do you get some birds, but you're starting to get these furry creatures coming to your feeder. There are different ways you can keep them out and it can all depend on your setup. So if you're not quite sure what to do or what you might be doing wrong, you think you've, got, you've gotten yourself all squirrel proofed, but you're still getting squirrels on it, on your setup, you can always take a picture of it and bring it into us and we can help you with that too. Sometimes the baffle is too low, um, sometimes the feeder's too close to something else, but we can talk about that here. Um, one thing you can do is get a squirrel proof bird feeder and squirrel proof bird feeders are all weight sensitive so birds are very very light they are mostly feathers their bones are hollow so they really don't weigh that much so when they sit on one of these squirrel proof bird feeders they can sit on it just fine you can have several birds on it um, they're just so light that they're not going to set it off but if a squirrel happens to come and sit on this perch, it, that will close down so they are denied access to the seeds. So as far as bird squirrel-proof bird feeders go, this is how most of them operate. They're weight sensitive. Um, we sell a line called the Squirrel Busters. This is a Squirrel Buster here. And the Squirrel Busters are probably the best squirrel-proof feeders on the market. They all work. They have them in different styles, so you can get them to, uh, to keep out birds from your sunflower seed, or excuse me, bird uh, to keep squirrels out of your bird feeder that has sunflower seed. We have them for Niger seed, for peanuts, for suet. So they really, really work. And the, they all operate in the same way where when a bird sits on this perch, they're completely light. They can feed all day. But as soon as a squirrel gets on there, the cage around it shuts down. A lot of these are, are adjustable too, so you can adjust the weight sensitivity of it. So if you're having issues with big blackbirds flocking to your feeders and raiding them, you can make the weight tension very, very, uh, very sensitive, and that can help keep some of the bigger birds off of the feeder as well. So these are squirrel busters. I have this one on the right called the Squirrel Buster Classic. Um, I've had that for several years now and I've never had a squirrel get onto it. And it's in a place where squirrels can definitely access it. So that has been a really great feeder. You've probably seen some of our squirrel proof feeders if you've ever been into our store, especially the ones with the fun videos like the Flipper. This is <clears throat> by the Drill Yankee Company. And again, it's weight sensitive. And when a squirrel gets on the perch at the bottom of the feeder, it will actually send the squirrel flying around. So it'll flip the, the squirrel around until they fly off the feeder. 
Um, this has a rechargeable battery in it, so you do have to recharge it, uh, but you recharge it just like you would your cell phone. Once the battery kind of starts to wind down, which usually takes a month or two, um, you pop it out and you just plug it into your wall charger, let it charge for several hours, and then put it back on the feeder and you're good to go. Now, if you don't want one that is rechargeable, that'll keep squirrels out, they do make some others. So the one that will send the squirrels flying through the air is called the flipper. And they also make one called the tipper, which is a tray that will also, um, uh, it, that'll drop down when the squirrel gets on it. They make one called the whipper, which has large perches on it for larger birds like cardinals and, and things. And then they make one called the dipper, that is small perches for small birds. So this is good for chickadees and finches. All these feeders hold five pounds of seed, which is really nice. I like that too. I have the flipper myself, the one that sends the squirrels flying around. Um, so I like I don't have to fill it all too often. That's a really good uh, perk for that. And then there's other styles too. If you don't like the tube feeder, we have these hopper style feeders that are squirrel proof and um, they're weight sensitive. So the birds can land on this perch, but when the squirrel gets on it, that perch shuts down and this door here covers up the seed ports. So there are different types that you can get. There are also some that are that have cages around them. We have tube feeders that you can put bird seed in that have cages around them. Um, those are good at keeping squirrels out, but the downside is they'll keep out the larger birds like the cardinals, for example. So if you want to attract the cardinals, but not the squirrels, I would stick with the squirrel buster and not something with a cage around it like this. But as far as suet feeders go for uh, keeping squirrels out, most of them are gonna have a cage around them. Um, so this is one here. It's got the cage around it. The small birds like the chickadees and the downy woodpecker, they can pop right inside that cage to feed from the suet. The larger woodpeckers will cling to the outside of it and stick their heads in. And if you remember, the woodpeckers have the really long tongue so they can um, so they can get their beak and tongue inside of there to feed from it. This isn't ideal for the really large woodpeckers, but they can find a way to make it work. So um, this is one type of squirrel proof feeder. And then the other one on the market is one from the uh, squirrel buster company they also make a suet feeder it's pretty large um so if you're looking for something kind of small that keeps away squirrels this isn't really ideal for you but it does work and then personally i think the best thing you can do is if possible put up a setup that will have some kind of a baffle on it and um, when you're doing a pole setup like this like on the left here this is an ideal placement because there's nothing around it that the squirrel can jump from to get on to this pole system. So when we're talking about squirrels and how how crazy the aerodynamic they are and how, um, how well they can jump and climb, um, they can jump about four to five feet up. So they can jump up very, very high and they can jump about seven feet across. So if you have your feeders or feeder set up too close to a deck or your house, you might see that the squirrels are crawling up your deck or crawling up the side of the, of the house and launching themselves seven feet across. They can absolutely do that. They can also jump from about nine feet um, high from something up high down below. So we call it the five, seven, nine rule. They can jump five feet up, about seven feet across, and then nine feet down from say, that's a, a tree branch or even your roof. Um, I had one that used to fly from my roof onto my pole, um, just launch themselves. You'd see the squirrels just flying through the air. They are pretty impressive in that way. So if you're putting up a baffle, you want to make sure it's up high. That's the number one reason why the baffles don't work. You know, we hear that all the time. Oh, baffles don't work. They don't work. Um, they don't work if they're down too low. So if they're only up, you know, if you only have them up two or three feet or so, the squirrel can easily just jump right over um, that baffle and go right up to the feeders. So you do want to make sure you know, it's four or five feet high, um, if possible, to keep the squirrels from being able to just jump right on over it. Um, they can't climb up and around the baffle. So the baffle, here's there's a, here's a copper one here. Um, but then we also sell, you know, this little bullet style baffle, we call it, or a can baffle. So the idea is the squirrels will climb up the pole uh, because they can't jump over the baffle. They do have to climb up the pole and then they'll go up inside the baffle and they just can't get around it. So that is how uh, it's, a, it's a nice barrier to keep the squirrels from getting to the feeders. 
And once you've got your baffle in place, you can put any kind of feeders up that you'd like because the squirrels can't get to them. So that's what I really like about putting up some kind of a baffle. It'll keep the squirrels from getting to any feeders. So you could use something then that isn't squirrel proof on the pole. You could get something more decorative on the pole. So these are really nice. Another thing we have, so say you do have a pole, but you can't baffle it. Like if you have hardware that's on a deck, if you've got something clamped onto a deck or screwed into your deck or side of the house, and you can't really put a baffle on anything like that. Um, we do have something called squirrel slip. And this is just, a, it's non-toxic, it's scentless, so it doesn't attract insects, but you can put this on the pole and they can't get a good grip on it. So that's something else that you can do to keep the squirrels out. You can also get baffles to hang above feeders. So if you have a, a feeder hanging somewhere where the squirrel is climbing down to get to it, you can hang a baffle above the feeder. Uh, but again, you just want to make sure it's in a spot where the squirrel can't just jump. You know, if it's in a tree and you've got your feeder and with a baffle above it, sometimes they can still jump from a tree branch or something just straight across to the feeder. So keep that in mind that they can jump five feet up, about seven feet across and nine feet down. So they are quite, uh, uh, quite nimble in, in those ways. There's also something you can put on a pole and this will work well too if you've got a pole that can't be baffled whether it's too small or too short or what have you. You can put up a squirrel slinky and the idea with this is that it attaches to the pole and when the squirrels climb they'll start climbing up the pole and then they can't get they can't climb through the slinky so they have to grab the slinky to try to climb up it and they just can't get a grip on it and they bounce up and down on it so this is another way you can keep them from climbing up a pole or climbing up some kind of hardware you might have um, with your feeders attached to it there's also hot sauce so Squirrels are mammals. They have more taste buds than birds do in general. So you can always put something called flaming, uh, flaming squirrel on your sauce or on your seed. It is a hot sauce. It's very, very hot. Um, and the idea is the squirrels can taste it, but the birds don't. So it's one way to keep the squirrels from eating your seed. Um, you do want to make sure that if you are using this, I would use gloves absolutely when you're applying it because it is very, very hot. And then you also probably want to use some kind of a bucket to apply it. Pour your seed in a bucket, pour this hot sauce in there, mix it up, and it got to be like a bucket or spoon uh, set that you don't mind kind of dedicating just for this because it is so, so hot. You probably wouldn't want to reuse this. Um, there's also seed and suet that comes pre-treated with this. Some of you guys have probably used this Flaming Hot Feast. It's been really hard to get from the company, but we do have more coming in on Thursday. So if you haven't been able to get it and you want some, give us a call. We can set it aside for you. Um, and we will be trying to get it in regularly. It's been really tough to get in from our, um, our supplier. We do have another brand as well that we've brought in to kind of get us through the gap. But again, this is all pre-treated and you don't have to worry about mixing it all yourself. And the squirrels uh, can taste that hot sauce on the seed and the birds don't. So this is really popular um, because it'll definitely keep the squirrels out. So not only do we have the loose seed, like this is a bag of the Flaming Hot Feast that you would just pour into a feeder. We also have seed logs of it, um, or we will come Thursday. Um, so if you are using the seed logs and you have squirrels that are going after them, you can get a Flaming Hot Feast version that the squirrels won't eat. And there is hot pepper suet and hot pepper suet is our best seller for this reasons. So if you've got squirrels eating your suet and you don't want to get one of those giant squirrel proof suet feeders because they are pretty big, um, your best bet's probably to just get hot pepper suet. We carry one called Never Melt Hot Pepper, which is our best seller, but we do have different brands and they do vary um, what kind of hot pepper that they use. So some of them are hotter than others. So if you've tried one and the squirrels are still eating it, which happens every once in a while, um, you might want to up it to the next level and get one that's even hotter. So we do have different types of varying hotness, if you will. So there is absolutely hot pepper suet and that's really good to keep squirrels out. And then there's safflower seed. So in general, for some reason or another, squirrels don't tend to like 
the safflower seeds. So um, just like how the, the blackbirds don't like it, like your grackles, if you've got grackles that are raiding your feeders, a lot of people will switch to safflower seed, especially in the early spring when they're migrating in because they don't like it. Apparently it's more bitter of a seed. So the squirrels don't really like it either. So this is something you can put in your feeders. If you have something like a window feeder that you really can't squirrel proof, you might want to put safflower in it and they don't really like that. And we do have safflower now in the, in the seed logs. So if you've got one of the seed log feeders and you want to keep squirrels off of it, you can put the safflower seed log in there. And then we also just started carrying little suet size cakes that are safflower. So again, if you've got a suet feeder, that the squirrels are going to and you're trying to keep them away you can do the hot pepper suet or you could do the safflower if you're looking for something a little bit different um the cardinals absolutely love safflower when i have safflower out i always have my safflower log out that is what they go to every time if they've got all the option all these different options in the yard they go to the safflower every single time so yeah, so here's your, your woodpeckers. So you can get your woodpeckers, but not your squirrels um, with the hot pepper suet. And then finally, I thought I would bring up houses um, because squirrels, this is the time of the year where we get the stories about birdhouses being raided, not only by squirrels, other birds will do it too, um, but squirrels and raccoons are known to raid houses and grab the young or the eggs and they will eat those. Um, so squirrels do this. Chipmunks will do it sometimes as well, um, but you can put things on the outside of the birdhouse to help prevent that from happening. Now, depending on how your house is mounted, you could always just put a baffle on the pole of your house as well to keep the squirrels from climbing up the house, uh, climbing up the pole to get to the house. Or you can put one of these tunnels on it. They're called bird guardians. And the idea behind these is that because they make the tunnel of the hole that much larger, it's hard for these squirrels to reach inside and get down into the feeder or into the house to raid it of the nestlings or the eggs. Same with raccoons. They just can't angle their arm in and down to raid that nest box. So if you are having issues with your nest boxes being raided, it could be a squirrel, it could be a raccoon, uh, it could be house sparrows are known to do that, and wrens are well known to do this as well. So it's hard to say who the culprit could be. There's many options of who could be doing it in, in the yards this time of the year, um, but this is one way you can help prevent that if it is a squirrel or you think it is a squirrel. So I thought I would share that for you as well. So thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, you can put those in the comments. Um, we will be having a couple of things going on here at the birdhouse this week. Um, first is we do have a binocular class going on. This is actually going to be off site on Thursday morning at Tinker Nature Park at 10 a.m. Um, we'll be doing a, a big sit binocular class. So you can bring your binoculars in. We'll show you how to focus them and you can take a look through them out into the meadow at Tinker Nature Park to try to really adjust your settings and get them all proper. So we'll have that class going on. We also have a class here at the birdhouse on Saturday on binoculars. That's our binoculars 101 class with Bill Stepinski from Nikon. If you've ever met Bill, you know he really knows his stuff as far as binoculars go. So he will be here on this Saturday, which is the 25th at 10 a.m. giving a class on binoculars. So we've got that going on too. So um, it looks like King Joffrey says, house sparrows also dislike safflower. So I was talking about safflower seed and how you can use it to um, to keep squirrels away and, and blackbirds. And I have found that too, that house sparrows don't prefer the safflower. So if I've got other feeders out, they're going to those other feeders. And then the safflower, they save for the very last. So they'll still eat it, um, but they I don't get the big, big swarm that I normally would with without, um, you know, with a, like say a black oil sunflower seed. So it can help keep the um, house sparrows away as well. So that's a very good tip. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's see, on. he says, great show, lots of good information. Also not certain, but pretty sure I saw a monarch in Men and Ponds yesterday. Ooh, that's great. Now's gonna be about the time. Um, I know my milkweed in my backyard 
just starting to bloom. I'm just starting to see the buds of color that are about to pop out. So that's exactly when these monarchs start to come into town. So that's really exciting. Um, I know one of you sent in a photo of a viceroy butterfly as well that was spotted. Um, they're the mimic of the monarch. So they're starting to be seen as well. And they're usually around the same time. We'll see both of them. So that's really exciting. So keep your eye out for monarch butterflies. So that's everything we have for you guys today. Uh, feel free to drop in on our binocular class on Thursday over at Tinker Nature Park at 10 a.m. or stop by the birdhouse on Saturday at 10 a.m. to uh, to meet Bill and get even more information about binoculars. So that's everything for today. And until next time, have a great week and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.